That'd be awesome. Yeah. We're live after technical difficulties. We don't stop. Just like the athletes, we don't stop either. Welcome to the Gill Athletics Track and Field Connections live from Prefontaine Classic 2023. Uh, this meet is always special, and it's even more special this year because it's the Diamond League final. So we've got things going on that uh, we ain't never going to uh, have seen here in Hayward Field. So it's going to be an awesome time. And I'm glad you're joining us here on YouTube live. I've got a couple of guests coming in. I think we're going to have a great time. We're just going to kind of just chop it up, find out what makes these coaches tick and the value that they're bringing to the athletes on the track. And uh, maybe we'll even get some predictions or two, uh, depending on how comfortable we have here. So, hey, let's start with our first guest. This is going to be great. I've got Joe. I love this last name. Del Chari. Dolce. Dolce. Yeah, see, it's my Italian's not that good. My English isn't even good either, man. So uh, it was good that I got there. Uh, Joe is with Exogen and with Leela. Yep, perfect. And we're going to talk about that here in a second. But Joe, to get us started, give us kind of a 30,000 foot level of your background in coaching, track and field. And I know we'll talk about some other sports that you've been involved in as well. Yeah. Uh, first, thanks for having me, Jeff. It's an honor. It's great to be out here. We're uh, excited to be back here for, like you said, this finals of the Diamond League. The weather's good. Everything looks good. So it's, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's great. Um, and I just flew in from Malaysia, the other side of the world where I live. And, and you know, that uh, going from the backwards part, I spent the last 20 years working with high performance programs throughout the Malaysia, throughout the Southeast Asia, Asia region, Australia, New Zealand as well. Uh, before that, uh, mostly those were Olympic programs. I actually came out to Malaysia, Singapore for the Olympics, uh, Sydney, Sydney Olympics in 2000. Oh, yeah. Before that, being a Canadian, I was based out of the West Coast of Canada, worked with the Grizzlies in the NBA. I uh, did work with the Canucks and a lot of the Team Canada programs and out at UBC. So I've been coaching for about 35 years. And I started in the strength and conditioning field. Okay. I was going to ask, how did you yeah. get into it? Yeah, right? yeah. I started with what they called S and C right. moved into sort of high performance, which is managing and overseeing the sports science sort of support services mm -hmm. for high performance programs. And now it's moved into a whole new level of very specific and elite consulting with the company. I have to imagine, I'm going to ask if you had, did you do track as an athlete, but you're from Canada. So I imagine everybody has to play hockey. <laughs> you all, everybody starts out playing hockey. I did as well, but I was a quick guy. So my goal, I was, you know, one of the fastest kids in my city. I played football. My goal was to play football. Um, we didn't, and you got to remember this is the eighties, right. early eighties. And so running track meant you showed up on the meet day and you ran something. Yeah. And, you know, we were the hundred meter guys. So there was me and a couple of people that were fast and we ran our hundred and our tennis shoes or whatever we had on. <laughs> but the funny thing, I do remember this a little a funny story at uh, our city meet one year, 17, 18 years old, we showed up and there was this guy there. He was about a six foot five uh, black guy that we, and, and, and my hometown in Northern Canada is not a very mixed community mm -hmm. and we were all watching this guy run and this guy there was there was something different he was 17 too he comes down he runs the 100 meter in 10.4 seconds this is i don't know 1984 yeah. 83 that guy turned out to be mike smith who won the world championships for the decathlon and was one of canada's most oh, uh, famous wow. famous uh, decathletes yeah. in history and he was growing up in some small town in northern ontario so that actually is my first real track experience he was trained as a track athlete mm. he was wearing tights and he had spikes on right right <laughs> we didn't even know what those were so i remember though seeing him and i thought i want to know more about why he's fast isn't it amazing when you see an athlete you know they're, you've seen fast like you said you guys were the fast ones and probably were the fastest on your teams things like that yeah we we're and all like 11 see, second guys yeah, you know yeah. in our tennis track shoes. fast yeah yeah it's a different beast yeah absolutely yeah. what drew you to uh track and field specifically in regards to your coaching and your snc background um just because of the love of speed so going back to that so seeing that mike smith for me wasn't just another guy saying a cool athlete as a young kid being fast i was fascinated with speed but more obsessed mm. and even when i built the company and it was it was around training athletes preparing for the olympics and the focus on speed and as we were talking a minute ago with some of the coaches you know speed is the core element that every sport is looking right. for and so in track it's running speed mm -hmm. in, in in the field events it's it's takeoff speed or throwing speed but it's still speed and and i and i joke about it in 35 years i've never once had a coach walk into my room and say joe we just got to get slower <laughs> And so if you're not into the game of speed, and that might mean movement speed, execution speed, whatever mm -hmm. it is, 
then you're not in the game of performance. How do you see, you know, I come from a track specific background, I played college, I'm sorry, high school football. Um, so I understand other sports and certainly in every, every, I imagine every other sport, maybe not golf. I don't know. Uh, but speed. certainly club head speed. Yeah. Okay. That's true. Uh, but certainly the footballs, the uh, soccer's, baseballs basketballs that you know the faster you are the better you can be not necessarily you are but yeah. the better you can be you can obviously like for um, a defensive back or a receiver for football you can make more mistakes because you're faster you can yeah, make up yeah. more but there is a difference i believe you're going to tell me in how you're training a footballer versus how you're training a, uh, a track athlete. yeah it's funny this is such a debate right now for any coach who's out there on twitter which i try to stay off of um, hey that's where i live so really it's okay. well, yeah, yeah, well i love twitter it's just because there's this conversation right now and i've seen all the big track consortiums that are out there training sport or talking about do footballers need to be sprint fast mm -hmm. or do they need to be able to be fast for football right. and the, and the answer to that question i i keep saying it's the wrong question hmm. we we need to wa see what track athletes are doing to become fast but they're running in a different pattern and a different process than a, a basketball player or a football right. player. But that doesn't mean we don't need to be aware of the techniques they use. Ultimately, if you're a great coach or an S and C in any sport, you're looking around you to pick up information that might be valuable. But if you're asking, should I train my footballer like a track athlete? The answer is no, because they're not track athletes. Right. But that doesn't mean there aren't great and important elements of that shape of that running pattern that can't help you. And so, because at the end of the day, it's running and yeah. it's on the legs, right? Yeah. So it's more similar than not, but it's a, it's a debate out there. That's hot. Are you focusing more? So, so like for a footballer and let's say, let's, let's go with the, the straight speed guys, like a receiver or a running back, you know, you're not teaching them the blocks, right? They don't have yeah. any of that. Uh, you have to be teaching the acceleration pattern a yes. little differently because we're not, you know, going out as long as, as we do in say the hundred. Uh, are you more focusing on the max speed side of it, or what? What are you? What, well, what here, are you focusing? Here's on there? what you're focusing on in team sport, and this is a critical part of the puzzle. In track, you are not going to have a perturbation in speed because all you're going to do is try and hit some version of your fastest. But in basketball, in tennis, in rugby, in football, you don't know when your speed has to stop. Mm. And the mindset of that needs to be constantly part of the strategy and what you're using speed for. Because, yeah, you can be fast. And sometimes it's a flat out foot race. You think of a DB and a wide receiver out there. And sometimes they're just awesome right. 30, 40 meter races. And the fastest one wins. But if that receiver turns around and says, I'm going to cut or I'm going to pull back, mm -hmm. he has to be the other, the, the cornerback has to be ready for that. Right. And so there's different strategies on where your body is balanced and how you're going to react. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call agility. And agility right, right. is the different component that a, a team sport athlete has to contend with in speed that a track athlete doesn't. Because you got to change angler a minute you got to go from yeah. going straight to turning left or right or stopping well and can you imagine if the 200 meter dash said the person in the front has the choice to choose the path <laughs> right as long as he covers 200 meters and so he just realizes he's getting beat and he cuts direction right now that would be a different game yeah. now you'd be running like a footballer but that's not the event you've got a lane that lane is not going to change to the very end <laughs> And really, you stay focused. Yeah, I'm imagining that, by the way. <laughs> imagine Noah going, you know what? We're just going left now, boys. Well, well he's, he turns around and realizes, oh, this guy will catch me if I stay on this path. As long as he covers 200 meters, <laughs> hey, it could be a sport one day. But, yeah, you're dealing with, in, t in team sports, you're dealing with the component of agility. Mm. And agility is the ability to move where you want, when you want. Mm. And that includes stopping. And so that's where we say, you know, we talk, my, my advice to coaches out there asking, does my footballer need to train like a track athlete? I would say go and learn what the track athletes do and figure yourself where you think that component is going to help you mm -hmm. within the confines that you might have to stop and change that direction. Right. So we don't have that in track. Thank goodness. Right. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're a little bit more pure, stay in the yeah. lane, things like that. But we do possibly have an, an uh, agility side of it. Uh, during our slowdown, our deceleration, right? And we don't really, on the Gill Track and Field Connections podcast, get into X's and O's. Yeah. We talk about more about philosophy. But I think sometimes we forget that, you know, that last phase of, say, the 100 specifically is deceleration. You're, you're trying to maintain, right? But then we do stop. 
and I've seen some people stop hard and I've seen people run an extra 400 meters uh, because of the amount of pressure that you put on ankles and Achilles and hamstrings. Are you teaching that in track? Are you teaching that in team sports or is that just, we let the body naturally learn that? I think, well, that's interesting. And I think every athlete has a different (sighs) speed is a feeling. And what's really important is to understand how different athletes express feeling and coaches will know this if they actually run. Remember you said, Hey, some athletes at the end, they continue through and they run 300 meters. That's because they're, they're connected to a feeling that's important to them. It's a natural decline. It's, it's a sensation that they're used to where somebody else will, will their feeling is I just, I'm going to make this end right right now. And I promise you they did that from the time they were a kid. So you've got to, it's really important mm. to understand what is the, what, what, what I call movement character. And so it's not necessarily right or wrong for an athlete. If you feel it's right or wrong and it maybe is going to present a problem or an injury or it's a waste of energy, then maybe you want to find ways to be better at it. But you got to be really careful about changing people's natural movement character. Right. The best coaches I know work within that. I will tell you right now of a very interesting real life situation with that. I won't say who and which coach you might already know one of these athletes who's at the highest level celebrates before the line. Mm-hmm. This is a natural pattern. It's so not, far I can't narrow it down because no. a lot of, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> now, and we've been talking about this. We've even been talking about ways to use our product to try and change that mentality, right. but that mentality is part of a winning mentality that's already in the athlete. So the question is not, how do we get them not to celebrate? How do we get them to focus longer? Oh, this is the, this is the, the change because they still have something in them that knows how to move into that pattern with the hand up. Right. And this is, this is again, when you work at an elite level, you really get into the psychology of the training even more so than the physiology. Right. And so it's, it's knowing what would be important to that athlete, why they do that. Because if you take something away from somebody that makes them fast, you're going to cause problems in other places that might not necessarily help you. Hmm. And I think these are, you know, they, it, this is why sport is such a challenge at that elite level because you have to, you have to take emotion. You have to take. Think of the conversation we had two minutes ago before right, we started. Right. Emotion, mentality, the physicality is probably not the big issue. Right. On any given day, we're looking at the track right now, yep. and there's, you know, Noah and Curly and everybody else. Right. On any given day, any one of these people can set the world record. Right. Yeah. Why don't they? That's what the best coaches understand. And so I think it's really important for young coaches coming up when they're, when they're looking at strategies around athletes is try not to change who that athlete is, but understand the things they need to work on. I think that may be holding them back and find ways within the way they work. So you mentioned not trying to change the athlete necessarily physically or their emotions. It's getting to the psychology of, okay, how do we, focus longer. So we're going through 100 meters, 101 meters in that example, maybe. When do you stop trying to change the athlete's physicality of it? Because, you know, we've had, uh, let's just use, uh, we're looking at our Shakari Richardson right now. So what I'm fascinated with Shakari is uh, as fast as she is running right now, she is still very young training age at this level. Now she was really good out of high school. So she's been at She's been at a elite level for a while, yeah. but she went, you know, from Dallas Carter, goes to LSU. She's under Dennis Shaver's care. Great coach, does an amazing job, only there for a year. And now I think this is her second year, maybe it can't be three. She's so young. Yeah. So she's she would be, three. she would be like a college senior right now, but she's on the top of the world. She's having yeah. to battle with the whole world. Right. When, when you're her freshman college coach, do you not change it there? She's an 18 year old. Do you wait until uh, 20, a, a traditional, she's 22 year olds coming out of college, goes to a group like Dennis Mitchell's, and then you stop doing it? There, there's got to be some point you're trying to change some physicality of an athlete. Yeah. Now, and I have to be careful here to stretch beyond my scope. You sure. know, I've, I work with Dennis. They're, they're one of our partners, Star Athletics, and I've had the, the good fortune and pleasure and honor to be there with uh, Shikari and the team now almost 18 months we've been working together and so i've gotten to see and learn and understand a lot about the development of that group uh, through dennis Mm -hmm. so uh, the first thing i have to say is i am certainly not at the level of expertise to comment 
on I think yeah, the psychology not, of the coaching. Don't be specific. With no, Shakir. no, no, yeah, I was just using no. Yeah, example. and I just yeah. want to be clear on that yeah. so nobody thinks that way. Absolutely. I mean, I'm there to help in in other ways, technical ways that we work on. But right. but my comment, my thought from my experience on that is always the same thing: is you know, the biggest mistake I see, and maybe this is the comment I'll give. The biggest mistake I see with athletes is when you always have to move forward. And when coaches, so you said there's there's probably still times they have to work on the physicality for sure. When the mistake I see coaches make at any level from high school to college or college to pro is when they don't know what to do. And so they go back to something that used to work. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I hear a coach or somebody turn around and say something like, oh, you know, we're going back to basics. I'm going back to my old coach. Things work there. So we want to get it all right again. That almost never works. Mm. And it, it's really so the answer to your question is it's really difficult to move forward. And so hey, I got to take advantage of this. Jeff, come here. I got to give a shout out here. You got to get in here. So. You know, we focus on the track coaches here at the Gill Connections podcast, but there are so many people that are behind the scenes in our sport that we just have to make sure we're we're, we're shouting these guys out when we have the chance. This this head right here, this is Jeff Oliver. Man. Jeff, what is your official title? Director of Communications and Marketing for Track Town? Official title, Senior Manager of Partnerships and Media Operations. He does it all, a lot basically. Of words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeff is behind the, um, uh, the um, oh gosh, what were you doing at 11 o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> this morning or last yeah, night? Yeah, yeah, this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good point. Press Good point. conference. The press conference. So when yeah. you see press conferences, someone has to set that up and manage that. Jeff is uh, you and your team there at Tracktown USA are doing a fantastic job, and uh, I just have to say thank you publicly. Uh, what what you guys do for our sport? No, appreciate it. Obviously, thank you guys for being partners of the Pre Classic and Tracktown USA. You know, uh, we keep telling people this is going to be a Pre Classic like that nobody's ever seen before. That's right. It's all shaping up, and we're going to have a great weekend. Awesome. Well, so far so good. All right. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. I just want to see like maybe what are we? What's the over under on world records? Oh, we'll see. The world <laughs> records on. Well, They're on coming. Ring, I can tell you. So, yeah. yeah battery. All right. Awesome, Thanks, Jeff. Man. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. Sorry. I, you know, yeah. Jeff no. 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 He's the reason track we're here. Town USA does an amazing, amazing job. And so, any of those guys, Mike Riley, Jeff Oliver, whenever we can catch them for a second, because uh, he's about to be moving on to something else now. Um, okay. Something I was going to add to that too. Yeah. Just uh, going back to that, and even a Shikari example is nobody's good at everything. So I know I know specifically what Dennis is working on with her because we work on those things together. And that's one of the things we use our product for are the specific physical areas mm -hmm. that are also tied to mental aspects of technique. So you at that level also, we're not talking about physicality on its own anymore. Right, right. In high school, you are. Oh, right. this person's weaker. And so we need to get them stronger. But right. at this level, all these components come together, the psychology of the technical component and possibly some physicality or strength or power component right. that needs to be developed because of that. She as technically good as she is and maybe the one of the best in the world. I figured. In, she's, in, in a minute, we'll get him one second. She's still you, working. Uh, you on relegate things. to the side for a second, then right, we'll get you. This guy can answer the question. <laughs> I got things I got to do. He should be sitting in my chair. We'll get him in here in one second. Absolutely. Well, and the point is, there's still parts of her race, like anybody, that need to improve. Yeah. And that means there's a physicality and a mentality to making those changes. So talk to us about uh, Leela and Exogen. What is this thing that I'm well, hearing everybody the talking there. about? Yeah. Leela. So Leela, Leela is weight training. That's all it is. But it's, it's, we spent over a decade and a half building it because we needed to make a weight training that the world had never seen before. Everybody knows if you go to the gym, you get, this comes back to physicality. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes you'll hear, well, they're weak at the end of the race or their max velocity needs this. So you kind of throw it back for a physical answer with some strength component. Mm -hmm. But one thing we started to discover when we looked at weight training applied to the body during movement is we had to be able to adjust movement on the fly, technically, emotionally, and mentally, if it was going to have an outcome in a race. And we ended up with a product that you can apply on the body, weight on the body, to any part of the body. But you can, once we start doing that, we're tweaking movement. And once you start tweaking movement, you're tweaking focus. You're tweaking understanding. And so an athlete turns around with, with our kit, and you don't hear them say things like, oh, I felt stronger. 
they'll come back after loading up maybe on the posterior chain. They'll come back and said, coach, remember that, um, that, that step I needed on the back end, how I'm not releasing. I now I'm feeling that. Mm. And so the products allowing a whole new level of education and technical sort of link between the coach and the athlete that, that we never saw before. Hmm. And maybe that sounded a little confusing, but at the end of the day, we created a soup that's compression based to which we can apply micro loads as little as two ounces up to oh, 12 yeah, ounces. Yeah, yeah. And they wrap around their, they're about an eighth of an inch thick. Right. They're skin flexible soft. Right. And you can put them anywhere you want. Yeah. And it sounds, that, that, that part seems important because when I was coaching track and field and still to this day, uh, we do a lot of sled pulls and things like that. And I always yeah. thought maybe we're pulling a little too much weight. So when you talked about micro two ounces, to 12 ounces, that seems more, correct in the load of an athlete no and nobody believes me when i tell them that the athletes we train with train in ounces now the right. funny thing is i was training athletes we were preparing a group of sprinters for qualification for athens in 2003 mm -hmm. i was on the track with them and we were pulling sleds and the whole time coach and i are trying to correct technique because they're pulling 20 30 kilos of weight mm -hmm. but get them to run fast right and i literally went home that night and i thought this is ridiculous and I remember thinking if we can move the weight off the sled and onto the body right. and then just tell the athlete to run, right. we would have achieved something. Yeah. I went online, you know, 20, this is 20 years ago. Tell right. you how long I've been working on this. <laughs> I went online that night and looked for weighted solutions. And all you had was even still a weight vest mm -hmm. and a, those old wrist weights and ankle mm -hmm. weights. Mm -hmm. right. And so I literally started cutting up wetsuits, cutting up weight vests. I, I, I played for almost seven years yeah. with prototype. Now, <laughs> I just happened to be working at an elite level sport. So I had the opportunity to put this thing on world champions right. and, and you know, the highest level of coach and athlete. And so we were constantly getting feedback yeah. at a very high level. And, and we, and the most amazing thing was my fear was, uh, we're not going to get enough weight on the body because everybody wants a heavy weight vest right. or you yep. need 30 kilos of, of weight, but that's not true. So what happened was when we started putting it on elite athletes, they were self-selecting weights lighter than we ever imagined hmm. so people were saying i don't want two pounds right i want four ounces but i want it on the back of my calf when i'm running 70s flat out right and that hits my hamstring and keeps my my ground contact at race speed right exactly and and so all of a sudden we were we realized jesus never mind building this we're gonna have to figure out how to use this <laughs> oh right yeah 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 yeah. so yeah, that, i was really worried you're gonna say two pounds to 12 pounds i was like oh man i should no. have this guy on here well you, you just, get it you mentioned two. that group kenny and yeah. shikari and the group down there when i'm on the track with them and we're tweaking movement we're using somewhere in the range of 48 ounces on a limb or body part maybe a total loading of on a body for a, an activity might be one to two pounds total right, load right. on an entire the body. Entire, right. Mm -hmm. They've been working with me for 18 months already. Yeah. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, yeah. it's, I, I like that. We, we created a, a new sled called the flyweight. Yeah. The same thing. It's like, I think just on its own, it's five pounds. It went light and it's, it has a, a tube for you to put some more weight on it, but it's not designed to put 45 pounds. There's other sleds for that. It's like five, seven pounds. If you, if you talk about a, a, a 10% rule. Yes. Y you know, there's not a lot of athletes that can handle. So, so 45. Here, here's what we did on the science on that. So you look at the 10% rule and you apply that to the whole body, 10% of body weight. Now you take a look at, so what does that mean? Cause we have a modular system where you could apply it on the lower shank, the calf, the mm -hmm. thigh, any part of the body. Now you break down those components. You 10% only becomes ounces on your calf right. or a pound right. on your forearm because you're distributing. Yeah. yeah. So you had to balance that. So we had to go into all the biomechanics of the body. We had to take a look at the anthropometry of it and then figure out and 10% is the max. Right. Right. You build up to yeah. 10. Right. 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 Or you don't even because 10%. Right. I'll tell you right now, nobody is putting 10% of body weight on the calf and running at full speed. Right. For sure. Not even for that limb segment. Yeah. Because Makes you're sense. going to get what's called an injury. Right. You exactly. Know? And we tried that with ankle weights. Hmm. Where can we go to see more about this? Uh, you just go to the website. It's uh, lilateam.com. So L I L A T A M dot com. Yeah. Lilateam.com. There's awesome. a ton of information. We've got a ton of videos out there, a lot of stuff that we're doing with Dennis's group, and we're now starting to share. Of course, the first year was all pretty secret. Um, sure. But now, you know, with we've got customers like Golden State Warriors, New Zealand All Blacks, Minnesota Vikings. I mean, most many, many of the big programs and elites in the world are coming to us. And it's just because the world is moving from right. heavy to light. Right. The world is moving from finally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, from max to optimal. Yeah. 
and yeah. and it's and it's exciting. Is this your uh, coming back here to the track here at Hayward? Is this your first Prefontaine? Yeah, uh, yeah. So you're gonna love it. What event are you looking forward to the most? A hundred meter, hundred meter, hundred meter, hundred <laughs> meter. No matter what the track meet is, yeah, is that the favorite meter. one? It's that's always always been in my head. You know, when Dennis was young and and competing, I was out there watching him and Ben and Carl. I mean, I knew the times yeah, of every one of these guys, you, my friend. Yeah, well, I'm. I think him and I. <laughs> that's right i keep i think yeah we're well like i said i'm i've been doing this 35 years i was 20 years old training my first team and wow. back in that day we we weren't training teams we were telling people why they had to weight train now oh, right 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 because remember nobody did weights yeah. in the mid 80s yeah now we're saying maybe we don't need as much as we yeah. thought you know are you brave enough to give me a prediction in the women's hundred Dennis, prediction, women's hundred. I think it's gonna be my gal right down there in those. No, I wasn't asking you. No, no, I wasn't. No, hundred percent. I was putting him. Hey, on the... I'm loyal to. Yeah, I was putting him, not you. Absolutely, I know. My friend... I know the right protocol here. <laughs> exactly. I'm I'm Team Star Athletics. Absolutely. I'm loyal all the way. It's gonna be one of our uh, lovely lionesses That's from it. Team Star, TT Love and Shakari and the team down there. Love it. The, I, they know how to do it, and I'm 100% confident they're going to do it this and they're weekend. They're using your using your product. Using yeah, your yeah. They it. not during the race. That might be no, no. That's a little cocky. That would like, be. I, you know, I'm so I'm going to win so much. I'm going to put. You know what? On one me. day we might actually get them to do that, just to show them, just to be cocky. <laughs> Good luck with that. Hey, Joe. Thank you so much, man. Really do appreciate Kill you. It's awesome. Uh, you are being helpful in more ways than one because I need to keep using your phone. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't walk off on me. Uh, but again, thank you so much. Uh, go check them out at uh lila team yep. i almost said team lila lila team.com yep uh and check out the exogen look sounds cool man i'm gonna go check it out I do love that it. and yeah. uh, let's have a great weekend awesome. thanks everyone thanks brother appreciate you all right well we might have another guest i don't know he's always on his phone and so he's on his phone now i don't i don't even know if i need a microphone for our next guest <laughs> no heckling no heckling so uh, here at the 2023 Priest Fontaine Classic, the Diamond League Finals, there's a few athletes you might have heard of. Maybe uh, Kenny Bedden. I never know how to pronounce his last name, but Bednarik. Hey, I'm his coach, and I don't know how Kenny to Kenny B. Bednarik. Like, he should go by Kenny B. Yeah, Kenny, that's Kenny what I call him, yeah. Kenny B. Kenny B, Shakari Richardson, a lot of other great athletes. And you got to come in a little bit here. Uh, it never happens without the coaches. And you know here at the Guild Connections podcast, that's what we do. We are uplifting and honoring coaches from around the world. And I can't believe I haven't had you on the actual podcast, but I get you here live. Remember, it's live. Don't be on CNN tomorrow. <laughs> you know help, it, man. Help me you welcome the wise, the wonderful Mr. Dennis Mofo Mitchell. What's going on, people? How you doing? I don't think very many people know that I officially gave you. know, You're a man of many nicknames. Yeah. Some good. Some other we won't say. You take them all, man. Take them all. But I remember, I don't know if you remember this. It was 15, 16 years ago when I first met you. It must have been at USATF convention. It we were was, going to lunch, was. and you were complaining. And this is crazy thinking about where you are and your group is mm -hmm. today. You were having a hard time finding a place to train with yep. your group. Yep. And you're like, man, Mike, I've got, you know, I go to this high school, and they're like, no, I go to this place. They said no. And I'm like, and I, you know, in my head, I'm like, this is crazy. Like, who wouldn't want mm -hmm. you and your group on their track? And I was like, hey, Dennis, you should just go up and tell them, say, hey, man, do you know who I am? I'm Dennis Mofo, Mofo Mitchell. Mitchell. Yep. And it is yep. the Mofo. Yep. Yep. That's what it's been. Yep. <laughs> And that's so, how our relationship started. I love it, yep, man. Yep. Well, thanks for joining us here on the live podcast mm -hmm. uh, for the Prefontaine Classic 2023. Beautiful Hayward Field. I love this place uh, for, for several reasons mm -hmm. uh, with the equipment out there. But let's start with you, Dennis. I don't want to talk about your athletic career. You had an amazing athletic career, mm -hmm. the green machine. The, do you think, do you still have the audacity? Do you think you are still the number one? Third leg four by one runner ever for, for TSA? Of course. Okay. Of course. All right. Just checking. Of I'm just course. wondering. That, that's that's one of the badges of honor that I carry. I think when people put together all time four by ones, mm -hmm. I think most still pick you for yeah, that third yeah, leg. So yeah. okay, that makes sense. I'm I'm with it. I won't argue. I won't uh <laughs> I won't challenge you to Yeah, race although there or... are some good guys out there, Correct. but you know, I think pound for pound, I was the best. Yeah. yeah. So uh amazing athletic career. Uh Gator alum mm -hmm. all the way through. Love Mouse Holloway, a Gill Podcast alum as well. What drew you into coaching? You're a talented guy. Uh, you're a smart guy. And you know, you know, I've had these talks. Yeah. This is not saying it in front of the camera. Um, what drew you into coaching instead of a lot of other things that you could have done uh, in private sector? Well, for me, it was just a, a maturation process. 
you know, when I uh, got on the tail end of my track and field career, um, and I was always a very personable person, you know, so I was always friendly with all the athletes that, you know, old and new. And uh, the younger athletes started asking me a lot of questions and they started asking to want to train with me at the end of my career. Mm. So the last four or five oh, years of my career, I was actually training a bunch of athletes that were training with me. Right. So I was coaching them as they were training with me. Mm. So the day I decided that I was going to retire, the next day I went back to the track because I had athletes right. there that were looking for me to coach them. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it was kind of one of those things that just kind of happened. So, and I fell in love with it. And here I am today. Some people run towards coaching. It sounds like coaching ran towards you. It drew me in. It drew me in. I never thought one day that I was going to be, you know, a track and field coach because of my family. You know, we're we're a family of teachers. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a history of everyone in our family goes into a school system and my, my degrees in special education. Right. And, uh, you know, that's where I figured I was going to go. Yeah. And uh, just didn't happen that way. I used my ability to be an educator, right. you know, on the coaching side instead. Now, I'm so thankful that you're a track coach. But when you talk about being a special education teacher, which, you know, teachers are a very special yeah. career path, a special ed teacher. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Like That's a you are an automatic range. angel. Yeah. You would have been an amazing teacher and special ed teacher. Well, that's why I went into special ed, because in my uh, uh, when, when I was in college, I had an elective class to where I had to go into a special education mm -hmm. classroom and, uh, you know, get some class hours. And the teacher there just saw that I was, you know, very good with the students. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the students were attracted to me. They listened to me, which is a great thing as a teacher, right. special education teacher. And uh, she's the one that kind of, you know, pushed me into going towards special ed. That's awesome. Because she said that, you know, we have a need there and you have a special gift. And, uh, you know, we need you. And, that is a gift. Uh, yeah. that's, that's the direction that I went. I love that. Yep. So have you been, I actually don't know this. I, I think the answer is yes. Have you been a, an elite coach from the get go or did you coach high school or college at all? I went straight into elite coaching. So that this is an extremely hard profession to be in, yes, in is. any level. Yes, it is. It's even harder on the elite side, at least when you're a college coach. Um, you get to go recruit kids. So, you you know, you, you should always have a crop of kids coming mm -hmm, in and mm -hmm. things like that. And, uh, you know, heck, sometimes you just kids just show up. So you get someone to coach mm -hmm. on the elite level side. You've got to go find someone to coach. Yes. You've got to go prove to that person that yes. you're the right yes. coach. How do you how did you get into uh, and you kind of maybe that's where it started was those guys that you were training with as you were also competing. Is that where it started the genesis of the elite level side well, of it? it for me it really the didn't business? start it really didn't start from the athletes to me it started with me okay because i looked at my situation and i said okay i've made this decision that i'm going to go into coaching so i have some choices i have to make right you know am i going to start at the high school level and work my way up right am i going to try to get you know uh, an assistant coaching job at a college or am i going to go where i'm the most challenged and i decided that being an elite coach going after Olympic medals and world mm -hmm. championship medals was going to be the most challenging thing in coaching that I could possibly do. And I chose that direction. And I said, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it the hard way. And <laughs> now understand if I had to do it over again, I probably would have went a different direction <laughs> because I didn't know the challenges that I was sure. going to face. Yeah. Like finding um, the track, <laughs> like finding the track and, right. and shoot, putting food on the table Ooh, half the time, yeah. you know, um, you know, it's a very difficult journey mm -hmm. uh, to get where I am today. Um, am I glad I did it? Yes. Yeah. Would I have probably picked a different path? I probably would have only because of the security mm -hmm. that it would have given my me and my family. Right. right. Um, but, um, you know, here I am today. Yeah. Um, I'm I guess I'm relatively successful at what I do. Yeah. And, you know, I'm happy. My athletes are happy. And um you know, we're, we're on our way. What, what year would you call your first year of being a coach? I mean, being successful at this no, level? No, no, being a coach. Like, uh, you're, you put your stake out. I'm an elite level coach. Come to me. I'm trying to figure out how many years have you done this? Oh, I mean, I started, I retired in 2000 okay. as an athlete, and I started coaching 2001. Wow. So 20... if you want to take those few years before that where I was right. mentoring athletes. Yeah. You know, so, it's a little bit longer than that. But. So we'll say 20 plus years. Yeah, 20 plus years. What years. have you seen? The world's different 
in those 20 plus years, not only in regards to cell phones and social media mm-hmm. and things like that, uh, but just in general, facility, you have a facility to train at yeah. now fairly regularly, which is good. Uh, the athletes are different. Mm-hmm. For kind of, and, and, and what I mean by that, because I don't want to steal what you might say here, the athletes are different in the sense of like, oh my God, everybody's running so stinking fast. Mm-hmm. What have you seen change in the 20 plus years on your level, this elite level, trying to get people to the Olympic podium? Well, in, in terms of the sport itself, you know, I see or I've seen a big shift in trying to make track and field a mainstream sport. Mm. Um, that's an administrative thing. Mm-hmm. In terms of the athletes, I think that the athletes are becoming more aware of who they are, um, not only as people, but as athletes also. Mm. And um, I, I think that that's a good thing because, you know, when we ran, we were just a bunch of athletes trying to make a living and trying to survive in the sport. Mm. And these athletes these days are trying to be something bigger than that. And, you know, I commend them for that because, you know, to be able to step out of our comfort zone, which is, you know, this track and field thing, right. to be able to step out of that comfort zone and try to uh, hey, put themselves <laughs> into a different light right. is, is something that I have Yo. to really commend yeah. them for because that's not easy. And, and, you know, coaching, any level of high school or college trying to get kids to the state meet and in college trying to get kids to the national meet it's extremely tough you're dealing with this much allowance of error Mm -hmm. on this level i don't know if i can get my fingers close enough the difference between first and fourth which is uh even third and fourth getting on a podium and you're not Mm -hmm. it's a it's a blink of an eye it's a snap of a finger how are you working with them uh today to keep that focus, to keep um, even keep their spirits up when they do get fourth or they mm-hmm. get third and they thought they were going to get first. How do you deal with that side of the coaching? So that's not the physical. There's no fly 30 that's right. going to help that. Right. How are you as like maybe counselor to the athletes? Well, the, the thing that I do, and, and I'm not saying I, I'm the only person or only coach that does this, but I try to do a very good job very early on in the season in terms of setting the tone. And the tone that I try to set is that, guys, you know, from the neck down, you give me 100 percent of that responsibility from the neck from the neck up. Mm -hmm. We're 50 50 Uh, and meaning that you you have have to bring some ownership to the table. Right. um, In terms of developing what you have to accomplish in that nine or 10 second or Mm -hmm. 19 second or 20 second period, 21 second period for the females. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to be able to start from day one being able to get an understanding is that I live in a world of seconds and you have to be able to process information. You have to be able to uh, be free in, in that 10 or nine or whatever, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. female or or male that is competing. You have to be ready to perform at that time. Mm -hmm. So we set the tone very early in terms of developing the mental, emotional and physical side of the athlete. That's why my group, you know, we are a family mm-hmm. and in a family, you know, we, we train everything. Right. And I tell my athlete, you know, I'm probably going to be training some things that you've probably never been touched on before. Right. You know what I'm saying? If you have problems mentally, we're going to work on that. Right. If you have problems emotionally, we're going to work on that. Physically, everybody comes to practice and everybody works hard. Right. You know, but those other tangibles that these athletes need to compete at this level, you know, I'm not afraid to go after those. Also. Yeah. They say the easiest way to go from number one to 100 is go pro in track yes. and field. <laughs> Have you seen, not naming names, of course, uh, athletes that just uh, all, the physicality is all there, the speed, the God given talent, it's all there, the training's there, and just mentally they can't handle lining up against this person and this person and this person, and it just doesn't happen on this level? Well, at this level, man, you know, you realize that there's only one person that wins a race, you know? Um, so in, in our field, we see more of that than not, than, than the athletes that are the total package. Right. You know what I'm saying? So as an, as a coach, you know, you have to make a decision whether you're going to go down that road and help that athlete in those areas, mm-hmm. um, or just let them kind of just kind of squirm, you know, through their career on their own. Right. But, you know, one of the things that I do pride myself on is being able to help my athletes in that area getting them emotionally and mentally prepared to compete right. because at the end of the day, when you step on the line, you know, there's eight or nine people there and you're one of them. Right. And physically you have to respect the fact that each and every one of them physically earned the right to be there. Mm. So you have to figure out a way as an athlete, you have to figure out a way how to separate yourself in a whole nother area. Right. 
because physically you're all the same. Hmm. You all earn the right to be there. That's a good point. So where's the other two areas that you can be better than your competitors? That's your emotional and mental side. Right. So you have to be able to, to, to understand you got to train that part of yourself too. How do you, as a former elite level, you've won the medals, you've set the records, uh, and now you can't do that anymore, but you're trying to help other people do that. How do you handle your emotional side of, because you're, you're taking these athletes to places you used to run. <laughs> like you can literally go to the track and like, oh yeah, I remember right there handing off the baton, or I remember right there is when I won and set my PR. How do you handle the emotional side of, I'm coach, so I, I can't get too high because I can't get you too high or too low, et cetera. How do you handle that coaching side for these? <laughs> well, these this is a question for you guys. I haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> um, you know, when you're when I was running, you know, and I tell the story all the time because people ask this question all the time. You know, when I was running, you know, I enjoyed the pressured moments because I felt in control of those moments. I knew what I could do. I knew I could win a race. I had a lot of belief in myself. But as a coach, you have what's called a non-coachable moment. And that's the moment when you have prepared your athlete to do everything that they possibly can do when they get on that track. But there's a moment to where you check them in and they leave. you, mm. And that's where they have to 100 percent take care of their destiny on their own. Right. And that's the most nervous, most nerve wracking point of my coaching is that when I cannot say anything to them, right. I cannot whisper to them, I can't give them a hug, I can't do another stride, another start, right. and I'm about to pass out in the warm-up area. Yeah. So, you know, that non-coachable moment is the toughest thing I've had to deal with as a, as a coach. It's a, a lack of control. You've given up the control That's at that it. point. That's it. Yeah. Is that, one of your hard, is that one of your hardest aspects? That's it. That is the hardest. That is the that hardest. Is, that is the hardest. Yeah. Everything else I, I'm a part of. All right. But that non-coachable moment, mm -mm. All right, let's back up to your group. You've had amazing athletes come through. Uh, one of my dear friends, Justin Gatlin, was with you as mm -hmm. well and always spoke very highly of you. It's amazing. So I love what you do. How do you, you know, a high school coach has to. Hold on one second. Oh. On. <laughs> hey, guys, let's go set those blocks. Go set the blocks. I'm coming. It never. Stops. Sorry, guys. It all, it, this is preparation. We got to track me tomorrow. To happen. That's right. <laughs> high school coaches have to roam the hallways. Hey, you look like you could run track. Hey, you should run track and go to the football team. Like, Hey man, you had a great run. Mm -hmm. You should run track. College coaches are out there going to every high school meet. Uh, hey, would you like to come to my school? Uh, they're always recruiting, right? Uh, how do you recruit? How do you get people to well, your team? Are you, are you at the NCAA championships at the finish line? Like, Hey man, you, you just won. You should come with me. No. <laughs> well, you know, in my field, it, it, it comes in a couple different ways. You know, you have, um, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Nike coach, so Nike signs athletes and, you know, sometimes they assign them, you know, to the Nike coach if they don't or if their college coach doesn't want them anymore. Right. Or some college coaches will say, hey, look, I got an athlete that I need you to take from me. Right. Um, you know, and, you know, will you take them on? Um, and a small percentage of it is us recruiting. Um, okay. We All don't right. go to the NCAAs and start pulling athletes from the track. Okay. You know, for us, that's kind of, you know, disrespectful sure. to their coaching environment. Right. So, um, you know, our main thing is our calling card is, you know, our accomplishments, mm. you know, our accolades. You know, if you're a winning coach, you know, athletes are going to want to come and be coached by you. Right. Um, you know, I've I've had the fortunate ability to be able to win the world championships on the men's side in right. 100. And now I've had the opportunity to win it on the women's side. Yeah. So you get a couple phone calls. Yeah. You right. know what I mean? But your accomplishments at this level set, speak everything. Right. Speak volumes. All right. Last couple of topics. And I'll let you go because I know they got to get those blocks going. See, I told you they're calling me. They're calling me. All right. Well, I, you got two, one I more got two more questions. <laughs> two more questions. Look, Here the athletes comes. are pulling up. They're right. coming to get me. I'm curious, specifically with Shakari. Yeah. Uh, you know, you got an amazing talent there. Mm -hmm. And then congratulations, mm -hmm. by the way. You guys did a great job. I'm curious because is this her second or third year out of out of college? No, this is her fourth year with fourth year. Okay, so she would be because she left after her freshman year. So this would be like her first year out of college, normally. If, if she had gone through yeah. college, right? So what I'm trying to get at is you have a, a obviously a special talent. God's given her a lot of ability, uh, but her training age at this level, mm -hmm. let's call it from Dennis Shaver to you, mm -hmm. so five this years. It's still really young. Mm -hmm. How do you handle this amazing talent that's still, I don't want to say she's still figuring things out. I saw a video of you guys doing the blocks the other day. She is still figuring things out. Mm -hmm. How do you shepherd that responsibility of such a young training age on a high-powered athlete? Well, at, at, 
at, at any level in coaching, if you want to have your athlete be the best at what they do, there are several core principles that you have to have intact as a coach. Let's spill it. Let's hear and it. Those, those core principles is you have to be biomechanically sound. You have to have the strength to be able to be biomechanically sound. Mm. And you have to have the mental and emotional stability mm. to be able to compete at this level. So those core principles is what principles are what I pull forward every single year, no matter what age the athlete is that right. I get them. So you have to bring those core principles to the forefront and keep them a part of your coaching at all times. Now, the thing that you have to do in terms of specializing with an athlete, you have to get that athlete into your program and you have to figure what those inconsistencies are. Right. And you have to attack them. Right. Um, you know, but there's not a, you know, this athlete is, is so young that you don't want to do these things. Right, right. You know, if an athlete wants to compete at this level, whether they're 19 or 29, you know, there's only one gold medal that's being given out. Right. You know, so you have to be the best of what you do when it's time to do it, no matter what age you are. Right. So whatever the athlete's capability of learning is, you have to maximize that for them. Got it. Well, you hold a special talent. You hold a lot of special talents down there. I know Shakira gets a lot of the press, but with TT, Benaric, amazing yeah, people, people. And Brown, they're, they're Kyrie, yeah. uh, and some new ones coming in. Yep. Uh, you know, you really hold a lot of uh, special things for Team USA. Uh, we, we won't be successful without your group yeah. and other groups, of course, but uh, we just want to wish you the best of luck, man. They're in great hands. I know that for sure yeah, from you. personal experience. Uh, and thank you so much, man. I know they're, they're yelling and chomping yep, at the we bit. We got to go, man. Get down go. So thank you so much. All right, man. man. Appreciate, appreciate it, it baby. Yeah, man. We'll see you. See you, man. All right. All right. Hey, you know, it never stops, right? Uh, I didn't even get to ask what he's looking forward to the most. Um, hey, Joe, come on in. Uh, I didn't even get a chance to ask him what he was looking forward to the most. I, I was not going to ask him like I asked Joe uh, a prediction. I'm not doing that to a coach. He, and he's got too many athletes in here. He would, it would just be bad. It'd be bad form. Uh, but we, someone's not. Yeah, it's not. It's never going to end good. So, um, Joe, give me some parting words as you look forward to the next two days. Uh, tomorrow, we've got half the meet. And then Sunday, we've got the other half. What um, give us some give us some words of wisdom. Um, actually, I was listening to you talk with Dennis, and you know, you asked me about my experience in track and field. I've had a pretty broad experience. Track and field is one of them, and and to be honest, I've had the honor and pleasure of working with many good coaches across sport. I've I've actually worked in every sporting discipline there is in every level. I saw cricket and, on your bio. Yeah, like, yeah, wow, uh, you name you've it. Done it all. <laughs> and now, now in that, I mean, it's the support service for those sports. So I get the chance to work and see how different coaches operate. And I have to say, Dennis is one of the best in the business yeah. and that's 35 years of business. And right. he made a comment that really talked about that. He said, you know, everybody comes to me physically ready. They're all, they're mm -hmm. all there at that game. And him and I were talking and I'll share something that he said. Yeah. And I want to this, because if coaches are listening and athletes are listening, I think that kind of wisdom is really helpful. And it goes off when he said, you know, they all come to me physical so where can you be better than somebody else? Maybe it's the mental or the emotional. Right. And he, we were talking about this the other day. When he first called me and said, Joe, we need your product. I know what I think it can do, but can it? And we, when I went down to Florida and we sat down and we talked a lot and he said, you know, everything you're saying makes sense. He said, because we're not in the game of more strength. He said, all of my athletes can basically put about the same stuff into the ground. Right. We call that ground force, right? right? And everyone gets really excited about that, the angle of that. And it matters when you're young and coming up, but very quickly that doesn't matter. And he said, what separates my athletes is not how strong they are, how much force they're putting into the ground. What separates my athletes is what they do in the air. And he said, that's, he said, airtime management. That's what separates the good to the great. And I've since gone on and used that term a lot. And you look at Steph Curry. Steph Curry doesn't do things at top speed. Right. But what he does in the moments to set up his steps, his shots, his fades, his passes, whatever it is, or any great athlete is exceptional. And so I know we often think of, hey, if I get more strong, more strength, more power, more this, but you're not being paid to be a weightlifter. You're being paid to move well. And technique is more important than fitness or right. strength. And I'm saying this as a strength coach yeah. who sold strength to all our athletes until one day I got asked a very good question from a world champion badminton player who uses an 80 gram right. racket. Right. And I remember we we're doing a bench press and he literally looked at me and he said, Joe, my racket weighs 80 grams. Why do I have to bench press 80 kilos? And I lied to him. You know, I gave him a answer that meant nothing. Right. And literally, you know, like, like Dennis said, 
think about what makes, he said, if I can help these athletes understand why they're fast right. and focus on that, they're going to be able to hit that more consistently. Right. And so I, that's, that's the message I think about is think about what wins. Yeah. You know, the really important things. And generally it's not how much you squat. Right. I, Unless the competition is squatting. <laughs> right, there you go. Right, it's your power lifter. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's amazing. The next level of coaching, you know, I heard someone talking about the other day and I don't remember what athlete, and I'm glad I don't remember what athlete, but something about their delts were so big from being developed on pinching yeah. and all that stuff that it was restricting their arm movement. So what therefore it was restricting there. And I was like, Oh my goodness. I never thought of that. <laughs> and at this, and at this level, you do. Yeah, you do. You do. And it's funny now on a, you know, like anecdotally, I box now and, and just an amateur boxer and I go in, I've got a Russian coach. And if anybody knows anything about Russian coaching, it's, well, I think it's the model for the world, right? It certainly mm, was. Yeah, sure. And because the technical proficiency they demand from the coach and the athlete is on a different level. And I, my coach looks at me on, I come in some days to training. He just looks at me and goes, you did, you did weights yesterday. And he said, I told you no pumping. He said, everybody knows if you want a box, you don't pump. Wow. And, and he, he can see it immediately. And by that, it means the pump in the muscle that you get from certain types of weightlifting right. are, will slow you down. And there's <laughs> going to be a whole bunch of people saying that's not true, blah, blah, blah. And I'm telling you, they're right. I, I mean, the, if the guy can look at you and say, you lifted yesterday, that alone, I'm like, All right, you, you win. And you buddy. could feel it. Yeah. So now here's the thing again. <laughs> weight training and the accenture the 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 ex accessorized training that we do all has a great place put it this way if you're a high level sprinter or you want to be fast you're gonna to have to do some squats mm -hmm. you're gonna need a v8 engine right but we don't spend a lot of time after the v8 is there worrying about making v9 or v10 right that doesn't that's not where more speed comes from mm -hmm. it's how you put all that together and think what dennis said athletes think they're in control of their speed and they shy away from the things they're actually in control of their emotional and their psychological state to training. And unfortunately, a lot of them only pick that up later because they believed my drilling and my weight training and my running was the only thing that was important. And so if you're a young athlete, even 15, 16, 17, 18, my advice to you would be start looking at how you run emotionally, how you run psychologically and make a note of the things that you're not good at in those areas because I promise you, those will be the things that hold you back. There's a million people who can get you stronger in a squat. Uh, we just had a comment from Old Paper Money and said, in high school, we're still building. And I, and I think yeah. you're right, 100%. Yeah. 100% uh, is I, right. And I do think if people focused on the basics and got really good at those basics, you'll be way better off. I, I think this level is just a different level of basics because yeah. you're already building on uh, hopefully four years of high school, closest to four years of college. Uh, so you have a developed athlete to that point. So you still have to, and I think Dennis even talked about the basics are important. Yeah. Uh, so I think you're always building. I don't care if you've got the Olympic gold medalist. And, I think you're still building. And I think his, the comment probably to, to give credit to that, that person who, who made the comment is they're saying, you know, you need these things to build that hundred percent. You need that foundation. And I think what's really important again to that, that comment is if you're a high school coach, know what you're building them for. Mm -hmm. You have to be thinking it's not my job to win. It's my job to prepare them for that college level. And if I don't know what that college level is, I better go talk to some college coaches and ask them, how do you want my athlete to look when they come to you? Mm -hmm. Now, some people know that and they build them very well. And there are some incredible high school programs and coaches and others are disconnected. But it's really important even for coaches, not just athletes need to know what the next level looks like. But coaches need to. Right. Some do. Some get it through experience, but some have no idea. And they're building the athlete to a ceiling. And the college coach gets them and think, man, what were these guys doing in high school? Mm. And I always think, why don't you guys talk to each other? Right. You know? Yeah. It doesn't always work out that yeah. way. That's the perfect world. But, uh, you know, and it's not everybody. I was having a, a talk with uh, Rye Benjamin's coach earlier this afternoon. And, you know, she was a pretty good hurdler herself. Uh, I think, I don't know if she won the gold, but she won a lot of stuff. She was definitely an Olympian, Joanna Hayes. And she mentioned I just, how I flew in with her today. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah she's she amazing. actually love her. <laughs> she mentioned how you know there's a lot of coaches who think that you could they could do better. And I'm reminded of we have a coach here, George Williams, coached at St. Augustine in North Carolina, mm -hmm. many many Division two national titles, was a Team USA Olympic head coach as well, being big time, highly regarded coach. And his saying is, if you don't, if you're not in the huddle, you don't know the play. Yeah. So it's 
easy yeah. to say, like she was using the example of her eye, who's had a lot of injuries. And she's like, oh, yeah, a lot of people come up to me and say, oh, man, he should have done this. He should have done that. And she's like, you had no idea that this happened in his personal life, that this injury happened. And so we've got to communicate better instead of being isolated yeah. with our coaches yeah. and our athletes. We have to be communicating more and judge less. Yeah. And I think that's a really good comment. Communicate more, judge less, because unfortunately we start with judge first and then communicate after when exactly. we found out we were wrong. Right. Amen. You know, what's you know, what's interesting is now the way I would approach this coaches are pretty approachable. I think if yeah. you're a young coach, one of the best things you can do is reach out to a coach that you admire, or you listen to and try and get into their ear a little bit comment, check, ask them questions, you know, mm -hmm. go visit. I think there's a lot of coaches out there that are willing to share, but you're right. If you're, if your version of sharing is watching what they do online and making a judgment about it, <laughs> right. you're going to be in the wrong direction. Yeah. Even I've been, now that I've had the chance for the last year and a half, two years to be with Dennis's team. And I see the comments that even coaches are making about why Kenny's running so well, or why Aaron's running so well, or why TT and Shikari are running right. so well. And they're breaking them down online. And I'm watching that. I'm thinking, no none coach. of that right that's none of what the, what's happening right. now, i'm not the coach but i'm on i, I know what we're right, working right, right and 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 it's, so i think wow you know we can we can really get lost in that conversation right. online yeah. right and i don't think a lot of people would find closed doors if they reached out to some of these coaches and said yeah do you mind if i pick your ear a bit yeah here's the fun part because i agree with you and as a you know former coach myself and now you know my whole job is to talk to coaches every day uh very open very authentic to having conversations it's the ones that say they don't want to talk to you mm -hmm. oh cool then you know exactly yeah, then, you know what? and luckily it's rare but it's like oh, okay cool i know not to talk with you or look at what you're doing. And they're probably not going to help you. Exactly. You know, it's, exactly. It, and, and you know, when working at Olympic programs, what I would see is the Olympics would finish or the world champions would finish or the Asian games or Commonwealth games would finish. And then we would read all the reports in the newspaper about this gold medal and that one. And there wasn't one report that was written that had any foundation on why that person didn't win. <laughs> right. Now I would live in Asia, so I can tell you some of those medals might've been decided before the games, sure. <laughs> but but yeah, you you know, there's usually very simple reasons why things didn't work. It mm -hmm. wasn't some big secret, right, you know. Right. And, and like Dennis was also saying, I hope people really pay attention to what he said because he is a brilliant coach in that, in in many ways, and is that it's the smallest detail can right. make a difference. And what he says is, if I can get those athletes to connect to the reasons why they're fast, because they're already fast. And I can get them to do that consistently. Right. Then I've done my job. Yeah. Because, like, literally on any given day, that group could set a world record. Hmm. You know, there's anybody in there is a is a world champion. Yeah. It's why a, don't they? It's amazing watching them. It's like, oh man, that person could set the world record tomorrow. That's why yeah. I kind of joked with Jeff Oliver about, uh, you know, what's the over under world records? Because yeah. the man, it could be every single event. I mean, the, this field is astounding. Theoretically, everyone. theoretically mm -hmm. there could be 100% world records tomorrow. 100%. Yep. Minus wind or whatever. All right, Joe, wrap us up here. You have a vast experience with many, many different sports. Which one is your favorite? Mm. To work with and, and why is it track and oh, field? Oh, easy. And why is it track and field? <laughs> well, track and field. Now here, okay, two answers, two two parts to that. Okay. So first off, track and field because it's absolute. It's like we talked about. Oh, I like. There's that. no other performance factors, and so you don't. You you somebody spends their entire life with nine steps in a jump, like a high jumper, and and I know that sounds crazy to most people but they work on that day in yeah. day out for the 10,000 maybe 20,000 hour rule and when you watch track and field the winner is obvious hmm. you don't have to wait for the ref right you know you yeah, what's our flag no, right, right guess what that bar falls or it doesn't fall yeah. you made the height or you didn't there's yeah. the line there's the track and the absoluteness of it and the loneliness and incredibleness and dennis talked about that when he says and then i have to leave my athlete and i can't be there anymore right that's that was that's really great. telling it is yeah. because i'm a team sport guy and i spent a lot of my life in the nba the nhl working with nfl teams you know professional rugby and there's a lot you can do constantly in a team sport activity mm -hmm. not only that you're yelling at them and changing the game while it's on right. and so that's a very different dynamic and so track and field to me is the beauty of pure athleticism in the fastest, yeah. the highest, 
in the longest. The absolute. I like yep. how you put that. The absolute. The absolute. And then my other, my favorite sport is the sport I played for many years is rugby. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. Okay. And I played semi-pro over in Asia for many years until I was quite old. Again, <laughs> uh, because I love team sports, but because rugby has a team culture. And yeah. it's one of the only sports that, it, you know, if you, if you, if you play rugby and you go to any city in the world and you don't know anybody, you just find a rugby club and you'll have family. <laughs> and um, wow. yeah, it's a special group that way. That, that, and the World Cup is on right now too, oh. and everybody's excited for France. And so but yeah, few sports I know almost zero about. Oh. I, I probably get rugby and Australian rules football mixed up. Well, well and there's there's a few. It's so American of me. Yeah, I think, no, it? yeah. I mean, even I. I well, I, I knew what rugby was in Canada, but I learned it when I went to Asia and I was big and strong. So they grabbed me and they stuck me out on the wing and said, just run. <laughs> okay, so I can do that. that. I can do that. <laughs> but but I found out what the culture was like. And I really think it's a special culture for sport. But again, coming back. And, and like I said, I love teamwork. And you yeah. really see that essence where, you know, you look at football, soccer. Mm -hmm. What drives me nuts about soccer is when somebody scores a goal, they run away from their team. Right. <laughs> That's not my mindset. Yeah. But if you did that on a rugby field, your rugby team would set would you straight. You know. They would let you know. You might have scored, but I gave you that pass. Right, right. And, and my 10 tackles put you in that position. I love it. And so they appreciate that. Yeah. But again, you know, we're going to see here in the next two days some of the most absolute, pure, beautiful moments in athleticism yeah absolutes and and yeah. and a track and field has that better than any other activity it. on the on the planet you nailed it man and it's all driven by these amazing athletes that every single one of them has a coach and so you know we're just always honored to uplift and uh uplift and honor those coaches that are driving this sport on all levels yep. and so it's a lot of fun to be able to talk to these elite level side and see what the difference is there in college and high school so uh we're gonna wrap it up here we're excited i i know this is on tv i should have <laughs> known this before i think it's got to be nbc and peacock and things like that but go check it out tomorrow uh i want to say it's like 11 to 2 Pacific time, and then kind of maybe that same time frame on Sunday. Uh, I'm going to set the over under on world records. I want to say one because I feel like there's one that's a really safe bet, and that's the men's pole vaults. Uh, yeah. Mondo, every time he steps on the runway, there's a shot there. That guy's special, um, too. You it know, depends it's... on the wind and the hundred, but boy, I tell you, Shakari is running, and Cons she's got you know what she's running? She's running consistently. Yes, and this is what we were talking yeah. about on any given day, that woman can do. Uh, maybe a 10 4 10 yeah, 5 but yeah. she's running consistently and and i think there's a lot of athletes right now amando you mentioned yep these guys are consistent right now right. and that's and that's where an athlete wants to be yeah yeah, I love it. I love it. Hey, thanks for joining us here on the Gill Connections podcast live from Prefontaine 2023. <laughs> You're good. You like, I keep you around. I love it, man. Uh, check us out. So we are on every podcast app that you have out there. Uh, if you don't know the show, every Monday we drop a new coach from the high school, college, elite level. We've got uh, some amazing alumni. You like uh, Grant Holloway? Uh, Mouse Holloway. He's been on the podcast. Uh, you like good distance runners? Dave Smith from Oklahoma State. You like good high school coaches? Man, the USTF CCCA. <coughs> boys and girls national coaches of the year they'll be dropping in uh, the end of november and beginning of december and then we're going to do this all over again we're going to be at the ustf ccca in denver on december 5th i think it is it's that monday that's not the right date december 12th maybe 11th check out my twitter at my kind of i always have my dates there we're going to do live again where we're going to have coaches at the convention sit down with us tell us what they like what's going on in the season and just have a little bit of fun because that's kind of why i do my job right so thanks for being here guys have a great day appreciate you thanks so much dude thank you if you